and welcome to Civiltà Cattolica. I'm most honored to welcome all of you and offer a few opening remarks at the meeting dedicated to the global ecological crisis, Chinese and Western perspectives. I give a special welcome and word of gratitude to our distinguished speakers. Thomas Friedman, a well-known journalist and writer and three-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Professor Wang Ji Su, Dean of the School of International Studies of Beijing University. And Paul Lai, Senior Fellow at Georgetown University and a respected journalist and writer. Thank you to everyone present here, bishops, professors, esteemed professionals, journalists, and friends. It is also a great honor for me to initiate here in Rome the activities of the China Forum for Civilization Dialogue, a platform for dialogue with China created together by Georgetown University and La Civiltà Cattolica. A special thanks to President De Gioia for believing in this project and having accompanied it since the beginning. I'm also grateful for the collaboration of Tom Bankchoff, Vice President for Global Engagement at Georgetown University. The China Forum aims to be a platform for meeting and reflection that brings Chinese thought leaders together with international counterparts to discuss common challenges at the intersection of culture, technology, and global society. The forum's first three topics are the crisis of ecological civilization, the ethics of artificial intelligence, the humanities education for a global era. I want to remember an image that can guide us in a, a meeting comprised of differences and harmonies. President Xi Jinping used the image of many colors in an address to UNESCO in 2013 to describe what he called the magnificent genetic map of the path of human civilizations on the earth. And he added that the palette of colors of the various civilizations is enriched by greater exchanges and reciprocal learning, offering prospects for the future. That talk was diametrically opposed to the, to the so-called clash of civilizations. Paul Francis also used several times the image of the palette of colors and the polychromatic light, proposing the civilization of encounter as an alternative to the uncivilized clash. The China Forum plans to host expert seminars and high-level public events in leading global cities, including Rome, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and Beijing. A first seminar hosted by the Ricci Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History at the University of San Francisco brought together Chinese and Western scholars in August to address the changing role of the humanities in higher education. A first major public event on the global ecological crisis takes uh, place now in Rome. Other initiatives are planned. The China Forum has an advisory board whose chair is Father Federico Lombardi, who I thank for his efforts. The alliance between Georgetown University and La Civiltà Cattolica is written in the DNA of our institutions, which have a great history behind them and are both global. Georgetown University is the oldest Catholic university and largest Jesuit university in the United States, founded in 1789 by Archbishop John Carroll. Georgetown today is a major student-centered international research university offering programs in Washington, D.C., Doha, Qatar, and around the world. Civiltà Cattolica is a bi-monthly journal founded in 1850 by, by pa Paul Pius IX. 
It is the only journal overseen by the Secretariat of State of the Holy See, and it is among the oldest periodicals in the world. Since 2017, it has appeared in English, Spanish, French, and Korean, in addition to, Ital to Italian. The forum carries forward the tradition of uh, Father Matteo Ricci, uh, the early Jesuit missionary whose appreciation of Chinese language, history, and customs provides a model for productive intercultural encounter. In 1601, Ricci wrote an essay on friendship where he brought together Chinese wisdom and Western wisdom. When you consider your friend as yourself, Ricci wrote, then what is distant becomes close, the weak becomes strong, the disgraced are brought to prosperity, the sick are healed. Pope Francis himself closed and chose the theme of friendship to speak about China. We have learned so much from Chinese culture, which arrived in Europe thanks to the study and passion of the Jesuits. Today, geopolitical and cultural challenges make it essential to deepen our friendship and our encounter on issues relating to our common home, the world, and its harmony. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I want to thank Father Spadaro for opening our gathering with such uh, wonderful reflections. I could not imagine a better setting for this convening of the China Forum for Civilizational Dialogue here in Rome. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you, alumni leaders, friends, partners, for this very special conversation. I'm grateful we have this time to be together. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our distinguished guests who are with us, in including His Excellency Archbishop Silvano Tomasi and His Excellency Bishop Paul Tai. Bishop Paglia, it's an honor for us to have you with us for this convening tonight. And I'd also just like to take a moment to thank our two panelists, Wang Ji Sa and Thomas Friedman, and our moderator, Paul Eli, and I'll introduce each of them in just a moment. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Georgetown for their contributions to bringing us together this evening for their work alongside our partners here at La Civita Cattolica on our China Forum for Civilizational Dialogue since we launched it this past summer. As, as Father Spadaro indicated, it's shaped by the legacy of early Jesuit Father Matteo Ricci and his example of intercultural encounter in 16th century China. And this forum brings together Chinese thinkers with international colleagues to reflect on challenges at the intersection of culture, technology, and global society. We begin this work this evening with a focus on the crisis of ecological civilization, an urgent global challenge and a theme that reflects a rich dialogue between Chinese and Western ideas. Last week, the COP24 began in Poland with the intention of advancing the Paris Accords and the actions necessary to realize its ambition and urgency. On its opening day, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, Vatican Secretary of State, addressed the delegates in attendance and shared these reflect reflections emphasizing the perspective of Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home. He shared, and I quote, we're standing before a challenge of civilization for the benefit of the common good. In the face of such a complex issue as climate change, where the individual or national response in itself is not sufficient, we have no alternative but to make every effort to implement to implement a responsible, unprecedented, collective response intended to work together to build our common home. Well, there's perhaps no issue more appropriate to open 
our China Forum for Civilizational Dialogue here in Rome than the challenge of climate change, and to share their reflections, their reflections we're honored to have with us Wang Jisa and Thomas Friedman. One of China's most prominent international affairs scholars, an expert on China-U.S. relations, President Wang serves as the president of Peking University's Institute of, the, of International and Strategic Studies and has served as dean of Peking's School of International Studies. He's been a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Committee of China's Foreign Ministry since 2008 and is honorary president of the China Association for American Studies. From 2001 to 2009, he directed the Institute of International Strategic Studies of the Central Party School. He also serves on the International Council of the Asia Society in New York City and on the Advisory Council for the Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. And he's joined on our panel this evening by Thomas Friedman, three-time Pulitzer Prize winning author, reporter, and columnist who has written extensively on a broad range of issues from climate change to international relations, which will inform our, our conversation tonight. He's been a writer with the New York Times for almost four decades now, and he received his first Pulitzer Prize for reporting on the 1982 war between Israel and Lebanon. He's the author of six best-selling books, including his 2008 work, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, why we need a green revolution and how it can renew America. In 2004, he was awarded the Overseas Press Club Award for Lifetime Achievement and the honorary title Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II. In 2009, he was given the National Press Club's Lifetime Achievement Award. And to moderate our conversation this evening, we're grateful to have with us Paul Eli, a senior fellow at Georgetown's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Earlier in his career, Paul spent nearly two decades in publishing as a senior editor with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Himself, he is the author of two books, The Life You Save May Be Your Own and Reinventing Bach, and of a series of essays and articles for The Atlantic, The New York Times, for Vanity Fair, and Commonweal. And I'd now like to invite our panelists, Wang Jisa, Thomas Friedman, to the stage and turn it over to Paul. Thank you, President Joya, for uh, such a sparkling introduction. And thank you, uh, Father Spadaro, for hosting the event and for your friendship. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here with the two of you. Wang Jizu, thank you for taking uh, the trouble to come here and to travel uh, the distance that you've traveled in order to uh, be part of the conversation tonight. Um, Tom Friedman, uh, thank you for uh, accepting the invitation to, to pick up a strand of a conversation that you and I had in much less exalted for uh, my office uh, some years ago. He was my editor for four of those books. <laughs> the, uh, like a lot of people, I think my sense of the global e ecological crisis uh, came in large part from your work and also my sense of the importance of China and our, um, our dealings with China in the West as we try to grapple with the global ecological crisis. Uh, I think that you said to me almost 20 years ago that if, if we in the West are not uh, engaging with China as we deal with the ecological crisis, we're not dealing with the ecological crisis. So I had that in mind as uh, Pope Francis uh, created an opening to China earlier this year. And it's with that in mind that I'd like to uh, invite you to make your opening remarks. Good. Well, I go you. up there or uh, sit here? Sit right here? there is fine. Okay. Well, great. Um, such a cool room. I just got to get a few <laughs> pictures. <laughs> well, uh, Father Spadar, thank you very much for hosting me here. Uh, President Joy, it's a treat. I'm, I'm here with two very good friends, uh, Paul Eli, who edited four of my books, um, and uh, Wang Ji Su, who's been a great teacher and friend of mine uh, on multiple visits to China. Um, I thought that what I uh, could contribute most today is, um, let me just get this up here so you can all hear, um, is uh, to do what I do, which is when people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them that I am a translator from English to English. Um, uh, I try to take very complex thoughts 
and break them down in ways that, first of all, I can understand, um, and then um, uh, explain them to others. Because I uh, truly believe in the dictum that um, uh, now is the time for us to understand more so we may fear less. Because there's a lot of people today in the business of making us afraid. And so I'd like to apply that to this issue of climate. Um, uh, as Paul said, I wrote a book about this subject back in, in 2008, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And what I learned um, uh, from that book were, were two very overarching themes. Uh, one is that climate is a scale problem. And if you don't have a scale solution, you have a hobby. I like hobbies. I used to build model airplanes as a young boy. But I wouldn't try to change the climate as a hobby. You have to have scale. Um, but the only way you get scale on this issue is to get large numbers of people motivated to act on a problem that will primarily affect their unborn children. That is a real problem. That is a real problem. How do you get the world, in effect, to act at scale on a problem that, although we see it today and is already impacting our lives, primarily impact our unborn children? And my contribution to that effort is to try to be a translator from English to English, to try to explain to multiple different constituencies why this is a problem and why they need to urgently act on it now in order to give us the scale that we need. So for that purpose, what I thought I would do today is share with you how I try to persuade different constituencies to act on this problem. And I'm going to share with you how I talk to baby boomers, members of my own generation, about this problem, how I talk to Texas oil producers about this problem, how I talk to coal miners in West Virginia about this problem, how I talk to an army general about this problem, and how I would talk to a young child about this problem. So um, to members of my own generation, uh, I say, um, one day back in December 2007, I picked up the New York Times and I wondered if I was reading the Bible. There was a story from China about the world's last known female, Yangtze giant soft shell turtle that was living in a decrepit Chinese zoo in Changsha while the planet's only known male soft shell turtle was living alone in another zoo in Suzhou. Together, this aging couple represented the last hope of saving the last of their species of giant freshwater turtles. In 2008, the two were brought together and housed in the Suzhou Zoo in the hopes that they would produce an offspring. They did get it on, and they did mate, but all the embryos, alas, died in development. Chinese scientists were hoping for better luck the next season. That story symbolized for me the fact that with more and more species threatened by extinction, by the flood, today's flood, the growth of today's global economy and populations, that we are the first generation, my generation of baby boomers, is the first generation that literally has to think and act like the biblical Noah and think about how we save the last pairs of a wide range of plants and animals and insects. As God commanded Noah in Genesis, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Unlike Noah, though, it is our generation and civilization that's responsible for the flood as well. And therefore, we have responsibility to build the ark. We are causing the flood as more and more coral reefs, forests, fisheries, rivers, and fertile soils are spoiled or overwhelmed by commercial development, and only we can build the ark that's needed to protect them. Mindlessly degrading the natural world the way we have been is no different than a bird degrading its own nest, a fox degrading its own den, a beaver degrading its own dam. We can't keep doing that and assume that it's just happening over there. 
The scale of biodiversity loss happening today is having global impacts, as Conservation International likes to say, loss there felt here. So what that means for my generation, for we baby boomers, is that later is officially over. This psychological biodiversity red line that we have passed means that later was a luxury for previous generations, eras, civilizations, and epochs. Later meant you could paint the same landscape, see the same animals, eat the same fruit, climb the same trees, fish the same rivers, enjoy the same weather, or rescue the same endangered species that you did when you were a kid, but just do it later, whenever you got around to it. Nature's bounty seemed infinite, and all threats to it were either limited or reversible. In this era that we're in right now, given the accelerating rates of extinction and development, later is going to be removed from the dictionary. Later is no longer when you get to do all those things in nature that you did as a kid on your time schedule. Later is when they will be gone, when you won't get to do any of them ever again. Later will be too late. So whatever you're going to save, please save it now, because later is officially over. That's my message for my generation. What about to a Texas oil man? What would I say to a Texas oil man? I've actually had this conversation. What I'd say to them is I happen to believe in the science of climate change. You don't, okay? Let's set that aside. That's between you and your beach house, okay? I believe in climate change. You don't. But here's what I think we can both agree on. We can both agree on math. And we can both agree that according to the UN uh, Population Department, there are 7.2 billion people on the planet. And there will be 8 billion by 2030. 2030, that, that's not very far away. There's going to be another billion with a B people here. Now, if all those billion people decide they want to live in American-sized homes, eat American-sized Big Macs, and drive American-sized cars, we're going to burn up, choke up, heat up, and smoke up this planet far faster than even Al Gore predicts. That's just a math problem. People times consumption. So what does that mean? What that means is the next great global industry has to be clean power, clean water, clean transportation, and energy efficiency. If it's not, we're just going to be a bad biological experiment. So which of you Texas oil men believe we can make America great again, just to pick a phrase, without leading the next great global industry? Please raise your hand. There's only one thing bigger than Mother Nature, and that's Father Greed. And unless you leverage the market to this challenge, you will never get scale. And my way of doing that is trying to explain to that Texas oil man or that President Trump that if you think the only market dimension of this story is to keep burning coal and oil, you are missing the next great global industry. So how would I then talk um, to a general, an American general? How would I persuade him or her these days why they have to take climate change seriously? Well, this is a story that Italy actually plays a very important role in. You see, for millennia, the world was actually governed by empires until the 19th and 20th centuries, when after World War I and World War II in particular, these empires gave way to multiple nation states, so many that we woke up after World War II and discovered there were 192 nation states in the world. And um, the 50 years after World War II, they were a great time to be a weak little country. Oh my God. If you were a weak little country, that was your era. Why? Well, first of all, there were two superpowers in a global competition over a global chessboard to get you on their side of the chessboard. So they would throw foreign aid at you, build your government house, 
build your army, educate your kids at Patrice Lumumba University in, Washington, in, in Moscow or Georgetown in Washington, D.C. You could be Syria and lose three wars to Israel and get your army rebuilt for free all three times. Number two, populations were relatively moderate. Number three, climate change was very moderate. Number four, no one had a cell phone to see what Rome looked like. And number five, China was not in the World Trade Organization, so every little weak country could be in the textile business, could be in low-wage industries. Well, my argument of my last book, thank you for being late, is all that flipped in the early 20th century because of three giant accelerations in what I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. All of them today are in acceleration. The market for me is globalization. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. Technology for me, Moore's Law, that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. Put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And Mother Nature, which is biodiversity loss, population growth, and um, uh, uh, environmental loss around the world is also a giant hockey stick. These giant hockey sticks are now putting so much pressure on these weak little states that a lot of them are starting to simply fall apart. Some are just hemorrhaging their people and some are just collapsing. And the states that are falling apart first are those whose borders are all straight lines, or almost all straight lines. Beware of any country, Italy doesn't have to worry, whose border is a straight line because they are the most artificial. And the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law are putting tremendous pressure on all of them right now. And you see how everything basically flips. Because today there's no superpower competition, so no country, no superpower wants to touch you anymore, because all you win is a bill. Climate change is now hammering these countries. I just did a documentary last year for National Geographic, where we followed climate refugees from Senegal through Niger, up through Libya, across the Mediterranean to Italy. It starts in villages in northern Senegal. Those villages today have almost no men between ages 18 and 60. They've all left because the ground can no longer sustain them. There are too many, and climate change and deforestation have crushed the agriculture. Italy, Senegal today is already at two degrees rise average temperature since the Industrial Revolution. Two degrees rise average temperature. Where have I heard that number? Oh, that's what the Paris Climate Agreement is designed to prevent by 2100. Senegal is already there. They're going to four degrees, which is unimaginable. Second, um, populations have exploded in these countries. Syria in 1950 had 3 million people. Today it has 22 million. And you can't understand what went on in Syria if you don't understand that the Syrian revolution was preceded by the worst drought for four years in Syria's modern history. A million Syrian farmers and herders left their homes, flocked to the cities, where what? They got on cell phones. Cell phones that could connect them to human traffickers, or give them a picture of Rome. And Rome looked pretty good. Looked a lot better than bombed out Aleppo. And a lot of them thought they might try to go there. Uh, and fourth, China is now in the World Trade Organization, so nobody can be in the textile business. And it's weakening all these states. You know, I was in Egypt for Tahrir Square, the revolution there. And I was there for three weeks in 2011. I was away from my wife for three weeks. After three weeks, I went home. I went out to Egypt, Cairo airport. I went to the treasures of Egypt souvenir shop to buy my little honey, a little souvenir from where I was. What did they have there? Oh, they had pyramids, ashtrays. My, my honey doesn't smoke. They had sphinx bookends. My honey has bookends. Oh, what did they have here? A stuffed camel. And if you squeezed its hump, it honked. Turns out my honey doesn't have a honking hump camel. 
So I picked it up, turned it over, looked at it on the bottom, and what did it say? Say it with me now. Made in China, yeah. You're the lowest wage country in the Eastern Mediterranean, and there's now a country half a world away can make your honking humped camel cheaper than you can ship it and make a profit. Now all of these changes, climate change, deforestation, population growth, technology, and China are weakening these countries. Some are just spilling their people out into the world, and some are just collapsing, like uh, Libya, country Italians are familiar with, or like Syria, or like Afghanistan, or like Guatemala, or like Honduras, uh, or like uh, um, uh, El Salvador. Um, these, by the way, are the three most deforested countries in Central America. They cut down their trees, we got their kids. All of these things are related. Climate, technology, globalization. And what they're doing is creating more climate refugees, economic refugees, and migrants, almost 70 million today, people on the road more than any time since World War II. And they're creating vast new zones of disorder. And that's why I tell my general friend, the relevant geopolitical divide in the world today is no longer east, west, north, south, communist, capitalist. Ask any Italian. The relevant geopolitical divide in the world today is between the world of disorder and the world of order. And millions of people today are trying to get out of the world of disorder into the world of order, changing the whole politics of the world of order. You cannot fix that problem unless you take seriously the impact of climate change. That's what I would say to my geostrategic general friend. What would I say to a coal miner in West Virginia? How can I persuade him that climate change is real? Well, um, I would say, I think, this to him. If I were a presidential candidate, like uh, Hillary Clinton, um, visiting West Virginia, or Macron today, trying to persuade a French coal miner why to take climate seriously, I'd say, uh, thank you for welcoming me into your beautiful home. Coming here makes it very clear to me why you deny climate change. It has nothing to do with climate science. It has everything to do with your sense of home. You see, when some northern liberal politician comes to your coal mining community and says you have to stop mining coal because you're polluting the world, what you actually hear is something else. My guess is what you actually hear is them saying, you need to give up these beautiful mountains that framed you, this job that gave you lifetime employment, this union that secured your family, this music that inspired you, these communities that anchored you, this pub that recognized you, this culture that identified you, the neighbors and cousins who warmed you, the cuisine that nourished you, the veterans club that sustained you, the hunting rifles that protected you, the churches that baptized you, and the bowling alley that connected you weekly with your workers, friends, and family. That's what we're really saying to these people when we tell them to give up coal. In short, when you hear them saying that, you have to give up coal and go to the city and become a coder on software, you hear them saying, they hear us saying, we need to give up everything that anchors us, locates us, and identifies us in the world, and gives meaning to their lives and dignity to their families. Is it any wonder that they reject climate science? Is it any wonder? Well, I have come here, I would tell them, to this special place to make only one promise and one request. My promise is that as president, I'm going to do everything in my power to help you stay anchored in this place you love, if that is your desire. My request is that you give me a chance to see if I can do it with wind power or solar power or energy efficiency, not just coal. If I can't, then I will not disturb you. The market might, but I won't. My goal is to help you stay home. My conviction is that I can do that without you having to go down in a coal mine every day. But I want to start with where you live, with where you're coming from, not where I'm coming from, 
and then see if I can take you somewhere else that can be a win for your attachment to this place you call home and for the planet that we all call home. If you don't start the conversation with people with what they really care about, because people don't listen through their ears, they listen through their stomachs. And if you don't connect with them in the gut that it's all about home, they will deny climate science with their last breath. Let me conclude with what I would say to a young child. And here I am uh, going to quote from a fantastic uh, eulogy that was given by my teacher, Amory Lovins, a great climate uh, physicist, uh, for Dana Meadows, who was a great climate scientist from Dartmouth who died in 2001. And um, this eulogy is what I would use to talk to a young person. Uh, a biologist, perhaps it was E.O. Wilson, noted that bees, ants, and termites, though not very smart individually, display high intelligence collectively. And then he added, people seem just the opposite. Dana Meadows was an exception. She was one of those promising specimens that's turning up more and more often in the search for intelligent life on Earth, one of those much higher primates whose love, logic, radical stubbornness, courage, and passion awaken the rest of us to our ability and our responsibility to save the world. She knew, taught, and lived the lesson that love is not only an untapped but expanding resource. The more you use it, the more you give it away, the more of it you have left. James Branch Cable wrote, the optimist proclaims that we live in the best of all possible worlds. The pessimist fears that this is true. Dana Meadows fitted neither category. She wrote three years ago, by nature I'm an optimist, to me all glasses are half full. Yet she didn't shrink from reporting bad news, always blended with encouragement about how we do better. She treated the future as choice, not fate, and she defined with luminous clarity how to do as one sometimes must what is necessary. She shared René Dubois' view that despair is a sin. So when asked if we have enough time to prevent a climate catastrophe, she'd always say, we have exactly enough time starting now. Two years ago, when emailing an unusually somber column about events that made her weep, she added the following note as counterpoint. A CEO was having to babysit for his young daughter. He was trying to read the newspaper, but was totally frustrated by the constant interruptions. When he came across a full page of NASA's photo of the Earth from space, he got a brilliant idea. He ripped the page into small pieces and told his young daughter to try to put it back together. He then settled in for what he thought would be a good half hour of peace and quiet. But only a few minutes went by before his daughter appeared at his side, tugging on his sleeve with a big grin. You finished already, he asked. Yes, she replied. How did you do it? Well, his daughter said, there was a picture of a person on the other side. So when I put the person together, the earth got put together too. There is so much to admire in that eulogy and pass on to our kids. The conviction that the future is our choice, not our fate. That when you put people together, you put the planet together too. That there is nothing in the universe quite as powerful as six billion minds wrapping around one problem. And most of all, the best expression of sober optimism I have ever heard, we have exactly enough time starting now. And if we fail to realize that, our kids will be just one more endangered species. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. There's so much there to store up and try to pose back at you during the question and conversation session. But First, uh, Wang Jizhu, uh, can you share your reflections on uh, the global ecological crisis with us? Thank you very much, uh, Paul uh, Ilay. And thank, uh, I want to thank everybody here who makes this event possible. Uh, when Tom Friedman referred to his generation, 
I reminded of myself uh, what I did when I was younger. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I was sent together with many others from Peking uh, University Middle School to the countryside. I went to Inno Mongolia on the grassland. I was a shepherd, a peasant, and then I became a factory worker uh, in Henan province. The, what did we do? Millions of students, high school students and university students in the countryside. Yes, of course, we did something we thought was good. But actually, we damaged the, the environment. We didn't grow too much wheat or whatever. Uh, I tried to learn a lot of skills. Uh, some of them are still useful today. For instance, growing vegetables. I grow vegetables in my, in my garden. But what a waste of time and energy. Uh, we did a lot to damage the environment. Uh, we didn't produce anything useful, actually, as a, as a, as a collectivity. So these are the old days when China was undeveloped, and we thought everything we should do was to produce more and feed ourselves grains, domestic animals, uh, Actually, people were not interested in flowers. We were interested only in food. Uh, but this, these are the old days. So for today's talk, I would like to make four points related to China and the environment. Uh, the first point is China has made impressive achievements in what they call building up ecological civilization a phrase referring to what is roughly known in the West as environmentalism. The second point, ecological civilization in China has been firmly in, ingrained into the country's political discourse and pronounced national goals. Third, ecological civilization today is faced with daunting challenges in China. And fourth, the current tensions between China and the United States may hamper China's effort in coping with climate change and environmental issues. One point I would, uh, would like to clarify is that I'm not uh, an environmental uh, uh, specialist. I study politics, politics of China and politics of the world. So the starting point is that China is a country of 1.4 billion people and the world's second largest economy. China experienced severe environmental damage, as I referred to in the old days. The Chinese people saw their country surge ahead to become an industrial power, the factory to the world, and they put up with environmental degradation, and pollution. But before long, many, including myself, realized that the path taken was unsustainable. China has committed to a sustainable path and building an ec ecological civilization as a national strategy since the 17th Communist Party Congress in 2007. The goal was to form an energy and resource efficient, environmentally friendly structure of industries, pattern of growth, and mode of consumption. With the coming into power of President Xi Jinping in 2012, he has led greater corrective measures that are turning things around and setting China on a course of sustainable development. China is undergoing a revolution in energy production and consumption, with plans to raise the ratio of non-fossil energy use in total consumption to about 14.3% in 2017 to about 20% 
by 2013. One example of China's effort to improve environmental governance is the, the establishment of the so-called river chief rule to be implemented in 2017. In addition, the lake chief system was founded in 2018. Under the plans, local government of, of officials will be named river chiefs. Uh, it's a very strange name. How can you become a chief of a river? But they are river chiefs and lake chiefs and will be responsible for dealing with water pollution. China has recently halted uh, previous plans uh, for building more than 150 coal fired, fired coal fired power plants. In electric cars, China is leading the world, selling more each month than Europe and the US combined. Additionally, China has the world's most extensive network of high-speed trains and has already passed laws to promote a circular economy where waste products from industrial processes are recycled into inputs for other processes. The Communist Party initiated a war on pollution just like its war on poverty, which will be eliminated entirely in the next three to five years. With an overall economic slowdown, the priority has shifted from quantity to quality in production, environmental protection, and becoming a global leader in the fight against the climate crisis. A law passed in 2014 to reduce CO2 emissions from, low, uh, from coal power plants has resulted in a 14% reduction as of June this year. New measures adopted in May this year will result in comprehensive recycling of hard waste uh, materials. China is one of a few countries to pass laws and develop a strategy to create a circular uh, economy, that is reuse, recycling, and uh, re-manufacturing. Uh, China is doubling the previous target for solar power production by 20, the year 2020 and is the largest producer of solar plants, uh, uh, solar panels in the world. In 2014, the country released a national air quality action plan. The Beijing area was required to reduce pollution by 25% and the city set aside an uh, astonishing uh, 120 billion US dollars for that purpose. To achieve these targets, China prohibited new coal-fired power plants in the country's most polluted regions, including the Beijing area. Large cities, including Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, restricted the number of cars on the road. The country also reduced its iron and steel making capacity and shut down coal mines. The results suggest that China's fight against pollution has already laid the foundation for extraordinary gains in life expectancy. Residents nationally could expect to live 2.5 years longer on average if the declines in air pollution persisted. The roughly 20 million residents in Beijing, including myself, would live an estimated 3.3 years longer. That is very good news. However, it is an approach that has come with some real costs. Many people were driven out of Beijing and many were left without heating 
in the early winter of uh, 2017. As a citizen of Beijing, I personally experienced these changes. I have had a country house in the suburbs of Beijing uh, since 2004. Early last year, I, redu uh, I replaced the coal burner in my house with a gas burner. The gas burner was imported from Germany and much more expensive than the coal burner produced in China. And burning gas for heating the house uh, is more costly than burning coal. I confess that I did not volunteer to do that. But the local government was very strict in carrying out the new environmental regulations. In my compound, where uh, maybe 300 uh, households uh, were living. Uh, there was an inspecting team in the vehicle roaming around every day last winter. When they saw smoke out of a chimney that is burning coal, they would immediately come to this house and destroy the coal burden without asking for your permission. So I was very much afraid of that, so I had to replace my, 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 my equipment. So ecological civilization was listed along with economic, political, culture, and social progress as one of the five goals in the country's overall development plan at the 18th Party Congress of the Communist Party in 2012 when Xi Jinping was elected uh, general secretary of the party. The key tenets of ec ecological civilization include the need to respect, protest, uh, protect, and adapt to nature, a commitment to resource conservation, environmental restoration and protection, recycling, low carbon use, and sustainable development. Xi Jinping has his personal imprint into this concept, which uh, will be definitely one of his political legacies. He says repeatedly, lucid waters and lush mountains are as valuable as gold and silver. Xi Jinping declared in, two, uh, in 2017 that the Paris Agreement was a milestone in the history of climate governance. We must ensure this endeavor is not derailed. Xi Jinping promised that China will continue to take actions to cope with climate change. The concept of ec uh, ecological civilization seems to be consistent with Pope Francis' thinking. As the Pope writes, and I quote, we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature." Unquote. As such, ecological civilization emphasizes the need for major environmental and social reforms that are both long-term and systematic in orientation. However, some people argue that China's political economic system is based on the need to maximize economic growth, uh, employment, and consumerism to an even greater extent than the West. As high, as high economic growth rate is related to the very legitimacy of the Communist Party rule. Furthermore, China plans to extend its influence further 
through its Belt and Road Initiative all the way to Italy and other countries, environmental concerns have become an obstacle to this ambitious plan. So the one question is, is China's vision of ecological civilization tenable? We know that to realize this, China's dream of great power status will compel the current hyper-industrialization to continue. It is difficult to create an ecological environment, uh, civilization while building a richer uh, superpower. And another question arises. Once China has gained its status as a leading world power, can it achieve yet another transformation and redirect its impressive vitality into growing a life of quality for its people rather than continued consumerism? For now, Chinese citizens are not encouraged to organize themselves with NGOs and seek environmental cooperation without tighten government control. And an ecological civilization as envisioned, uh, expected in the West seems inconsistent with a centralized bureaucracy forcing its rules on citizens through coercion. This brings to my final point, which is related to China's relations with the West, especially with the United States. Chinese leaders never openly endorsed the norm of liberal environmentalism, as it never accepts the concept of a liberal international order. China welcomes international cooperation in improving global ecology, but we have to note the different political values it holds. The tensions between Washington and Beijing range from trade to cybersecurity to military rivalry in the Pacific. But cooperation in the fight against climate change had once been a bright point spot, so much so that it propelled the creation of the landmark global agreement in Paris in 2015 to curb greenhouse gas emissions. Now, with additional economic pressure from Washington, China confronts a new debate. Should it continue to move rapidly away from its emissions incentive industry, industrial economy, or should it simply slow down? My personal view is that although the trade war with the United States could slow the country's transition away from a heavily fossil fuel-based economy, I don't think China will change course. And I hope China will not change course. We will continue to carry on the endeavor regardless of what the Trump administration does. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jizu, and thank you again, Tom. I'm going to succumb to the moderator's temptation here and take your two sets of remarks as representative of the cultures that you come from. So, Jizu, you explained the many things that uh, China is doing to uh, work to uh, ameliorate or combat the global ecological crisis to the point not only of having all sorts of large-scale projects, but trying to figure out how to uh, build roads to Italy without too great environmental impact and finding points of connectivity with Pope Francis of all people. And meanwhile, in America, we're still stuck at the place of persuasion where what we're building is custom-made arguments to different constituencies to try to uh, even persuade people to get busy in the first place. Tom, you saw this problem 10 years ago and you're your way of expressing it was to say that we in the United States needed to be China for a day. If, if we've got exactly enough time starting now, we needed to be China for a day. That was 10 years ago. What would it mean, is it still a, um, can you explain what you meant by that and what it might mean 10 years on for us to uh, f 
to find a way out of this um, um, cul-de-sac of persuasion and argument that we're in. Uh, is well, it possible? Thank you, yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you. So that was very interesting. Uh, in my book, uh, Hot Flight of God, that I had a, had a chapter called China for a Day. Um, and uh, it was just based on the notion that um, what would be so bad just for one day? Just one day. We could be China for a day. So what was that about? Um, it was about a notion that there's actually only, in my view, one thing worse than one party autocracy. And that's one party democracy. And what we have in America today is one party democracy. One party rules, and the other does everything it can to veto uh, their rule. Uh, Frank Fukuyama has called it vetoocracy. That's what we have. So um, I wrote something incredibly controversial. It wasn't controversial to me, but it was controversial to a lot of conservatives. Um, I said, if you happen to be a country that has a one-party autocracy that has, are you all sitting down? Looks like you're all sitting down. A reasonably enlightened leadership that might order more good things and bad things from the top down, you can actually do better than a one-party democracy, which now can't get anything done. And since I wrote that a decade ago, Paul, our one-party democracy has only become more of a one-party democracy, more of a vetoocracy. And that's why today uh, China leads the world in, in uh, solar panels, in, um, in carbon tax, um, in, in all the things that are, are necessary uh, to scale. So, of course, I, I don't want to be China for a day, I don't want to be Italy for a day, I don't want to be Spain for a day, I don't want to be Israel for a day, I want to be America. Um, uh, but I want my country to work democratically um, with the efficiency, wisdom, and foresight um, that some other countries um, on some issues, and I want to be very careful about this, some issues, like environment, um, uh, are doing autocratically. And um, uh, at some point you have to say, in my view, uh, I said this in my book, I think China has the worst political system in the world. But they're getting about 90% out of a bad system, in my view. We in America have the best system in the world, and we're getting about 10% out of the best system. So when it comes to an issue like environment, you really have to ask, who's the dummy here? And um, I'm afraid, you know, right now, the joke is on us. So Jesu, for your part, do you think that the policies and plans that you described in your remarks are exportable? Are they possible to execute outside of uh, the system that is China today? Can other countries follow the lead of China? Well, China is a one-party democracy, <laughs> uh, as we say it. But it is very difficult to uh, ask other countries to follow China's example because, because of the nature of China's political system. The system is so effective in producing more and then save more and then destroy more at the same time and then they, 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 they will be united to, for instance, to build high speed, speed railways without thinking of the cost of the lands. I mean, because there is little private ownership. There's no private ownership of lands. All lands belong to the, to, to the government or to the country. So, for instance, when China tries to help other countries build their uh, high-speed railways, it is difficult. It is very difficult, and I understand why it is difficult in the United States to build even a high-speed railway from Boston to New York City. So, uh, when we say China has, a, uh, has scenarios, as China has a, its own uh, path of development uh, that other countries could learn from, I think there is a limit. Uh, and uh, when I half joking, I say, if you really want to learn from the Chinese model, you establish your own Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> and it can make it uh, deeply rooted in every cell of the society. If you cannot do that, Forget it. <laughs> Very good.
Meanwhile, we have, you know, just to oversimplify, a kind of a polar opposition set up between what you set out, that China's doing, Jizu, and what's being done, not being done in the United States, Tom. But when Pope Francis ended the argument, there was a third uh, position of consequence, not original to Pope Francis, certainly, but enunciated with great force and, and clarity by him, saying, let's take a step back. We don't need to move so rapidly. We need to understand the scale of the problem, but question the scale of the solution. We need to uh, consider that our approach to the global ecological crisis may begin in, uh, in love for our common home, uh, which is prior to any, uh, any strategy. Is, is there a place, both of you, is there a place for that, um, that almost mystical approach uh, based on individual conversion in, in, this, in the schemes f uh, for, for working on this crisis as you understand them? Well, I, I very much admired the, um, the Pope's contribution and his uh, encyclical because it, it made for me what is uh, a truly essential point in this discussion, Paul, which is that you know, we tend to talk about climate change and the climate, okay? But the issue is actually the biosphere. Um, all the oceans and living plants and animals on the earth. That's actually the issue, not just the climate. Climate's part of that. But the issue is the biosphere that was bequeathed us and that sustains us. It's the mangroves that prevent uh, flooding. It's the trees that hold soil in place it's, and purify water. It's all of these natural services that nature provides for free that um, is, is the real bounty that we've inherited and the thing we must preserve. Now, where the Pope's encyclical, I think, becomes so important is that I could imagine, thanks to China, that we may, in the next five years, have a, um, uh, a big Jeep that will be all electric, an all electric Jeep. Does that mean I get to drive it through the Amazon? It's all electric, doesn't pollute anything. If you don't have an environmental ethic that says, I don't care if your Jeep is all electric, I don't care if it was made of banana trees, you do not have the right to despoil, use it to despoil the environment. If all you're thinking is that it isn't emitting and adding to climate change, it's the, the biosphere. And therefore bringing an environmental ethic to the thinking not just industrial environmentalism, which says, okay, this is a zero waste product, it's morally good. This is a zero emission car, it's morally good. I can drive it anywhere now. Um, uh, I think the Pope's voice on this is so important to how we actually think about this problem. It has an industrial scientific component, but if it's not matched with an ethical component, a, a a raw, uh, unmitigated uh, appreciation of the environment uh, and the norms that we need to preserve it as a thing in and of itself um, will be in a really bad place. And so um, I think the more we, we bring that environmental ethic to this conversation, the more we don't just allow it to be about emissions, um, but how we treat this whole biosphere, uh, the better we'll be. So, Jizu, the Pope Francis says it's our common home, it belongs to everybody equally. You know, it sounds like communism to me. Uh, how does that uh, sense of things fit into the vision of ecological uh, civilization set out by Xi? About 10 years ago, when people began to talk about climate change, you know, climate change was a very, not a very old concept. People, many people in China doubted that concept. They say it, it, it's more like a Western conspiracy to stop China from rising into a, a great power. And, but gradually, we, we realize that climate change is related to many things we have been doing, uh, like you know, uh, clean uh, 
waste and and uh, because climate change is not simply climate change, it is related to a lot of environmental uh, uh, diseases and, uh, uh, and pollution. So, uh, and uh, one big change is the uh, air pollution in Beijing, in Shanghai and other places. How can you argue that climate change is not real? We don't have to do anything. We, we just suffer from haze, uh, from smog. Uh, 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 and disease come around. So uh, it, it was a, a, pro, uh, a, a process, uh, a gradual realization that climate change and, uh, and environmental issues are related to our personal life, our long, you know, uh, life expect expectancy uh, related to everything. But it is still a, uh, there is still a long way to go uh, because people are, some people are saying that we want to make money. Uh, making money is more important than anything, everything else. Uh, I would rather suffer from, uh, from uh, air pollution uh, than from lacking money. Uh, people still say so, but that is, is changing very rapidly. Uh, especially in urban areas. It's almost as though, I think the great insight about globalization or the great excitement about globalization as it first, as we first felt it was that everything's connected. And then that's also the great insight about um, the biosphere, everything's connected. <coughs> and we couldn't have the one um, realization without the other. And we're now feeling the other very strongly, isn't that right? That uh, the interconnectedness of things is, is what makes this a problem of, of such magnitude. Well, and if you saw the movie The Martian, um, some, anyone here see The Martian? Did it come to Rome? I don't know. Um, but uh, the movie ends um, with a scene where uh, the Chinese space program uh, sends up a rocket uh, that boosts the Americans and enables them to save the American astronaut who's stranded on Mars. And I don't know about any of you, but when I saw that movie at the theater I saw it in, in Maryland, where I live, a lot of people applauded uh, at that scene, at the notion that the Chinese space program would send up the rocket that saves uh, the American astronaut stranded on Mars. And um, it only shows me that in our DNA, we have tribalism. But in our DNA, we also have this desire to connect, uh, to work together uh, toward universal aims. And, um, you know, Mother Nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. Right? My teacher, Rob Watson, taught me. She's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't talk her up, you can't talk her down. You can't say, Mother Nature, the economy's a little slow this year. We got a knucklehead named Donald Trump as our president. We're gonna take a year off, is that okay? She's gonna do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And to put it in American baseball terms, Mother Nature always bats last, and she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with Mother Nature. And that's exactly what we're doing. So we'll either learn that early or we'll learn it late. We'll learn that separately or we'll learn it together. But we will learn that lesson. And um, this, I go back, Paul, to where I started. This is a scale problem. When I say scale, I mean global. You know. And it can only be attacked globally. And um, I have no doubt our kids will be doing that because they will have no choice. We are that in-between generation that still thinks later is possible, but it's not. And Mother Nature will teach that lesson that later is officially over. And the only question is whether Dana Meadows is right that we have exactly enough time starting now. if we don't have enough time. China had, suppose, su su suppose, 
So suppose it's too late, even though China has made great efforts, uh, the scale of the country and its economy, uh, what will happen if, if, if climate change and if we've really ruined the biosphere and, and severe climate change is upon us in 12 years, what's, what's China going to look like? The trend now is, uh, I mean, the trend of climate change is, is, is reversible if we do enough things. Um, but I, I don't have enough scientific knowledge on that topic. But I think, you know, in China's own culture, uh, within a larger historical context, it's not too surprising that this vision of uh, harmony between human and nature, or what you call mother uh, nature, should emerge from China's tradition. Traditional Chinese uh, culture was founded on a worldview that uh, perceived an intrinsic web of connection between humanity and nature, in contrast to the European worldview that saw humans as essentially separate from nature. But I don't know whether it is true or not. Early Chinese philosophers believed the overriding purpose of life was to seek harmony in society and the universe, while Europeans pursued a path based on different set of values, which have since become uh, global in scope, driven by conquering nature and viewing nature as a machine to be engineered. And I think the, the modern Chinese uh, thinkers learned a lot from Western philosophers. And now we are, become, become, we are coming back to the, the old Chinese philosophy, uh, seeing the nature and the human beings are the same, uh, as you say, ma mother nature. We haven't talked at all about the poor. The poor bear the the burden of this ecological crisis, the externalities of bad behavior are, are offloaded onto the poor. That's one of the most important contributions of Pope Francis' encyclical. What, uh, what are the poor to do in this, in this world that we're entering, uh, Tom? Is there any way they can be persuaded to, to, to move the needle, or do they have to wait for people in power to do it for them? Well, again, the tragedy of climate is it hits hardest the people who did the least to, to cause it, the tragedy of climate change. Um, if you look at the places most effective along the equator, for instance. So, um, and, and, but at the same time, um, energy poverty is uh, a huge problem for the poor. Because if you don't have energy to light a light so your kid can study at night, uh, if you don't have energy to refrigerate medicines, uh, or food, you're, you're, you're deeply disadvantaged. But um, where, where, the, where the two can come together is the, the good thing is that sometimes when you're so behind, you know, you can leapfrog forward. You don't have to have a landline, you can have a cell phone. You don't have to have a coal-fired power plant, you can go straight, you're not stuck with that. You can go straight to, to solar panels. You so skip some of the problems with right. the Industrial Revolution. But, I've always thought it was part of the moral obligation of the developed world to actually make available uh, at, a, at a price point these technologies for the very people who have been affected by climate change, most climate change that we, we created. And Shizu, in China, even with the tremendous uh, movement of people into the middle class, there's still a, a phenomenal number of poor people in China. Can you speak to what the global ecological crisis is going to mean for them in the coming coming decades? Well, I think uh, in China, as everywhere in the world, economic inequality is exacerbating uh, the, 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 the social conditions. I think, as I said in earlier, I think China has made great progress to uh, uh, accelerate economic growth, but there are still many people living in the countryside uh, who are poor, who are uh, uh, not healthy. Uh, and uh, a big problem in the Chinese countryside that is that 
many people uh, come to big cities, to urban areas, leaving behind them children and women. That is a very, very daunting uh, challenge to villagers uh, leave, uh, left behind. And so the, it is not simply a, a poverty issue, it is an envi environmental and a, a, a social issue. So things are coming together because they are left out there without uh, attending, uh, attending schools, I mean the children, and they, uh, they have diseases. And then in the countryside, uh, uh, HIV is, a, is a, a big problem in some areas. Uh, so we need a lot of things to do. Uh, si people are, some people are complaining in China that we have uh, too, too much foreign aid. We have done a lot in, the, in Africa, in, in, in Central Asia, in South Asia, uh, but we ha still have a lot things we should uh, cope with uh, in, in our agrarian uh, areas in the countryside. So this is a, it's a, it's a very comprehensive challenge to China today. Before we turn to the audience for questions, is there something, Tom, that you'd like to ask Jizu or vice versa? What's the kind of thing that you ask each other when you're, when you're in conversation, say, in China? That, that Tom, whether the uh, Trump administration will come back to the Paris Agreement. Is there any chance? Is there any chance the Trump administration will come back to the Paris Climate Agreement? No. Zero. Um, Trump was tweeting yesterday that the rioting in Paris um, only proves how foolish it is to try to deal with climate change. Um, Trump's an idiot, and, um, uh, and he's an indecent person. Um, I won't get started on this, but he's, a, a, he, he's a, he is not going to come back to uh, the, the climate agreement. Questions from the audience? Yes, Jose. I think you have persuaded, I think you have persuaded all your audiences. The question is, will have you moved them to action? Because a lot of us are persuaded, but we are not moved to action. And you seem to imply precisely when we got to the discussion of La Dato Si, there's the moral ethical aspect of it. And there is a sense in which we have to change, obviously, our relationship to nature. You call it mother nature, so it's a way of, it cannot be simply an object, it has to be. And this is what primitive indigenous peoples have, a kind of nature, something sacred. We need to resacralize nature to find some part of it. So the question is, to which extent is that only a question of one party system? Because it's not the political system per se, it's the entire civil society also does not move to do anything. So we cannot expect the political leaders to the American people what to do, but the American people themselves don't do anything about it. And as to uh, the question of China, obviously the Chinese Communist Party is able to mobilize very well, the Chinese population on the basis of a Chinese national identity, but it has a lot of difficulties mobilizing Tibetans or Uyghurs in this project, because the nation state project, much of this competition, has to do also mobilization for the sake of the nation state. And I'm not sure how much the system can help to mobilize those who are not part of the nation state. I'm thinking of uh, let's say China, the Chinese traditional empire, was much able in dealing with non-Chinese people as part of the empire, that it is done with those people within the nation state. So I think the nation state itself and a world system of nation states is a fundamental problem also of how to deal with this ecological problem. So ultimately, I think that China is doing very well as long as it's understood as a competition of states and nation states. But the relationship to those who are not part of the Chinese nation, it shows to me the, 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 the limits of this, of this model, but maybe you may respond. Question, I, I'd simply say from my point of view that when I really get into my dark moments, um, 
I feel that um, what we're actually waiting for as a human race is we're waiting for the perfect storm. What is the perfect storm? A storm that is big enough to end the climate debate once and for all, but not so big as to end the world. I, I, I fear that's what we're, we're waiting for. Now, absent that, and given all the um, issues you rightly raise, um, where I can be optimistic, more optimistic, is if I look at where good government uh, has actually worked, to leverage both the market and regulation to create real definable change, and that's California. So let's look at what Macron did um, in, in France, slapping a diesel tax on, and look actually what California did. So California's approach was all built around performance standards. Simply said, if you want to have an air conditioner installed in this building, it has to use this little energy or carbon. Um, only it did that for everything, every part of building a home. Their now target is a zero energy home, a home that will actually generate as much energy as it consumes. And they do it through performance standards. And it's worked to a point where Californians now have the lowest average electricity bills in America. So that, that's then leveraging the market as well, because on a scale problem, if you don't leverage both, if you don't shape the market through regulation, you really can't get scale for the reasons you said. And there was a recent Pew study. It asked Americans, it may have been young people, list your top, I think it was 28, don't quote me on this, but I think it was 28 concerns. I believe climate was number 28. You know, um, uh, but it certainly is for very few people number one, you know, so as much as we talk about it, um, uh, that it, it isn't there. And so that's why it takes such far-sighted leadership, you know, to, to actually um, produce the kind of regulations that can shape the environment. I, I, I always tell young people um, who want to get involved in climate change, I, I have a one fundamental rule when thinking about uh, environment and climate change. And my rule is, if it isn't boring, it isn't green. If it isn't boring, it isn't green. And that comes from uh, the book that Paul edited. Um, everyone wants to be Al Gore. I have to tell you, I am jealous. I want to be Al Gore. I want to win an Oscar, an Emmy, um, uh, uh, make movies. Everyone wants to be Al Gore. But unfortunately, we all can't be Al Gore. But if we can't be Al Gore, I want to be the guy I profiled in my book. Um, his name's Goldstein. He worked for NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. He was the guy who got all the regulations changed for how much energy a Coke machine can consume in America. Now, do you know how many Coke machines there are in America? And if you can get the regulations changed for how much energy an air conditioner or a Coke machine can consume, you're, you're an even bigger hero than Al Gore. Now to understand how to get the regulations changed for a Coke machine, you have to understand how a Coke machine works. You have to understand how a utility works. And you have to understand how a utility commission works. There is no more boring institution on God's green earth than a public utility. It is the most boring institution in the world. But if you study those regulations and you figure out how to leverage them to change the energy of just a Coke machine, let alone an air conviction or heating system, you can change the world. And that's my message to young people. If it isn't boring, it isn't green. Everyone wants to sell their coal stock. Well, sell your coal stock, but that's not gonna change the world. Figure out how to change a Coke machine, and you've changed the world. I want to add something to that. I, I mean, in China, um, as you discovered, uh, the Communist Party is very able in mobilizing the population and doing what they are asked to do. But I think 
the population and public citizens have their own incentives. And sometimes they organize, uh, they are organized to uh, have some program. For instance, several years ago, about five years ago, there was a movie uh, done by uh, a young woman, a TV anchor, uh, on environmental uh, problems. And it was very well received uh, in, in among intellectuals and, and citizens. But it, it is seen as a criticism of uh, the, 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 the slow movement uh, in, in the country done by the government. So then the film was banned. But in, in whatever the case, uh, it pr propelled the government to do more although it, the, the film was not, no longer uh, available, it, it did a great deal to uh, encourage citizens to participate in the, in the movement. And things uh, like that happen almost every year uh, with, 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 with some more government regulations uh, in the right direction. So I think we should encourage uh, more uh, public participation in uh, the effort to uh, cope with climate change and environmental issues. A uh, question from uh, Mario. Just, just very short. Uh, uh, according, given the, the fact that all Western democracies are becoming a little weak, and uh, somehow inefficient. And that if it is not boring, it is not green, and if it is not boring, hardly you will win the elections in a Western country in this moment. Well, and given that one of the major actors, the United States is now playing a strange role in this uh, global health, uh, what do you think, both of you, could be done, in which direction we have to work, given that this is the situation for the, to save the biosphere? That's a really good question. Next question, way back there, somebody had their hand up. I think. No, it's, uh, it's a very good question. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're, uh, we, America, are taking a time out on this issue. We're, we're taking, a, I hope, only a four-year hiatus. But we're taking a time out. Um, and uh, I think that's tragic because the whole theme of the book I did with Paul is that um, I think if America goes green, the whole world goes green. You know? And if America doesn't go green, we give an excuse for everyone in the world not to go green. It's not, I don't say that as uh, jingoist, it's just a fact. You know? Our power of example can be enormous when we, when we do the right things. And when we do the wrong things, it's also enormous. And we become the biggest excuse not to do anything. And so we're, we're behaving in a, in a really destructive way right now at a crucial time. Um, and uh, there's not much more I can say. We just have to wait two more years and, and hope that we get um, a different leadership because um, uh, we're, we're not ourselves right now. Dennis, did you have something? Sure. Uh, these days we seem to think that artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to solve all kinds of problems for us. I'm just wondering whether you think that there is hope in that level of technology somehow getting us out of the dilemma we've got ourselves into. You know, Dennis, artificial intelligence will um, uh, absolutely help um, uh, because artificial intelligence really turns into intelligent assistance. It's how AI turns into IA that really matters. And I flew over here on United Airlines. There were GE engines. Those engines actually are connected in real time to General Electric, the sensors on the engines. And they can advise United what altitude to fly to get the optimal energy efficiency. Uh, same with GE locomotives. 
So it'll definitely help. It's all necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, uh, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to take us out of this, out of this problem. What will that mean in China? To artificial intelligence, what will that mean for, for advancing an ecological civilization? AI and other high-tech innovations uh, are helpful uh, in the sense that they will save energy, uh, they will save uh, 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 human uh, uh, labor, uh, uh, but at the same time, um, these new technologies will create more inequality among the people in China. Um, you know, we have so many um, people in Beijing uh, doing transportation. It is easy to just get uh, consumer goods from, uh, from market to home. In a few moments, you get them. But if you have electric cars and then you have uh, 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 cars without, uh, without drivers, human drivers, uh, how do these people find their jobs? Uh, you have to retrain them and ask them to do something new. Uh, and so this is a, it's something that, is, that seems to be very good. It is good to, uh, to our health. It is good to our, our uh, longevity, but it also costs a lot to the people who, are, who do not have enough resources to help themselves. You know, Paul, I think the biggest, to pick up on Dennis's question, though, the biggest challenge for, for this pope and the church as it tackles this question of climate is going to be birth control, uh, population. Because you can have all the AI in the world, but if you have a billion more people, um, uh, it, 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 even consuming energy efficiently, it, it will have such an impact on the planet and the carrying capacity of the planet at this stage that it, it's hard, because if it is people times consumption, um, it's going to be very hard to, to address this issue in a meaningful scale way without addressing the question of, of population. I think that's the case, but I also think that we were long past the point where we think that the Pope can just uh, tell a billion people what to do on the question of birth control. That, that uh, pe people are making their own choices uh, in all countries. Uh, let's uh, move now to the to a you know more informal conversation. The reception outside. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Jesu, thank you so much. Thank you, Antonio Spadaro, and thank you, President Joya. It's been a, a great privilege to uh, just take a role in this conversation. We'll pick it up outside. Thanks. Thank you.